Hi, everybody. Welcome. If you're new to my channel, my name is Linda K, and I am here talking with Dr. Ed Johnston. And we all know him from Justice or from Criminal Justice Matt Natters, correct? Yeah, that's okay. correct. Yeah. So if you would like to introduce yourself and tell us about your long list of credits, we'd love to hear them. Uh, thank you, Linda. Thanks for having me. Um, so my name's Ed Johnston. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in law um, at the University of West of England as my day job. And um, I research and teach uh, criminal procedure with a particular interest in fair trial rights and the role of the defence lawyer. And sort of part of a sort of natural progression in terms of trying to get sort of my work that's from academic journals and into the wider sort of community, I thought a YouTube channel of breaking down complex criminal justice issues into something that can be digested by my mum's the goal, really. Um, she, she says she reads the books in the articles, but uh, not, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, well, I just don't know, I don't know if she does, but um, it, it was the goal of like having something like that, of like the, the, these, these issues are, are important. And I didn't want just to focus on sort of defense representation. I want like a broad spectrum of issues within the criminal justice system because there's problems at every single stage. Oh, so yeah. um, that, that that was the goal of the channel, and that's what I set out to do in sort of October. I had a buddy of mine, um, his name's Andrew Allen, he really uh, really encouraged me to do it. Because um, I didn't know if people would be interested. I didn't know if I could get people. Um, so, yeah, I had the encouragement from him and the encouragement from my partner, Wolfie, and uh, she was like, it's going to be great. So... It is. Yeah. Thank you. It is. Thank you. We are all very interested. I mean, you've had some excellent. I mean, I like I said, what's your secret? I mean, that's how we yeah. first met was me leaving yeah. a comment. What's your secret? Because I've been doing this for um a year. Um, I'm you know, not real big on views and everything, but you I mean, look, look at Kathleen's uh interview. You've gotten how many uh 5k 6k views already yeah, um, almost six yeah yes yeah, so i mean that's fantastic you know and and your guests are interesting and they're they're right in our realm of our community you know um every single one of the interviews you've had have to do with what we are all invested in a daily mm. basis so um you know, I mean, just just that in itself is wonderful for us. So welcome to our community. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's really great to meet you. And um, your background is so interesting. Um, criminal defense, I mean, that's so broad. But to make it where it's fair, where you have the fair part of it, you know, because it's really hard to, um, I mean, we see the injustice in the cases that we look at. Mm -hmm. So breaking it down in the fairness part, you know, I mean, to me, that's like kind of changing the justice system. <laughs> you know, there's so many things wrong with it in our day now. You know, when they made it back then, it probably fit. But there's so much mental issues going on with people, um, different scenarios. It's hard to just have that one one thing. So do you hope to make a change with your with what you do? Um, hopefully, yeah. Ideally, what I would want would be a fairer justice system. And, you know, that starts right at the beginning once someone is arrested. I think in England and Wales in particular, and in, in the broader sense of, of the word of society, I think there's a presumption of belief that the police, police have the correct person immediately. And I think there are so many safeguards that are designed to protect people from unjust convictions or miscarriages of justice. And I don't necessarily think they work entirely as designed. Um, yeah. So ultimately, some form of change to make things better mm. would be the end goal. But in terms of sort of just criminal defence, we don't have enough young people going into it as practicing lawyers in this country. The average age of a criminal defense lawyer in some parts of England and Wales will be in their 60s, especially that's oh, true wow. in rural, rural areas. Oh, Students wow. don't necessarily see it as a viable career, but the ones who do buy into it have such passion for, you know, 
to to make the system work to to, to make mm -hmm. it fair everybody should be presumed innocent when you are arrested when you are charged right. until you are convicted and i right. don't necessarily think that plays out in the media and just in the general the, the general sense of the word I, I don't think people respect the presumption of innocence I agree. I have to agree with you 100%. I don't think there is any uh, innocent until proven guilty anymore. No. It, it's it's you're guilty and you need to prove your innocence. And yeah. um, it, it just changes the whole dynamics of anything in court. You know, I mean, before it was all the state has to prove, the state has to prove all you have to do is defend, you know, and now it's you have to bring up things that are you know, like their job, you know, so yeah. it, it, it just changes it completely. I do have a question right away. It says sure. uh, from Miss Piggy, what is your personal view on the Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey cases? Um, well, they're, they're obviously inextricably linked um, to, uh, um, for, for one. So uh, you, you can tackle this together. Um, I, I believe neither of them committed the offence. I've only based it on, you know, the lawyers I've spoken to and the Netflix show. I, I, I'm not as invested in terms of you guys who carry out research. And I've spoken to people on Twitter who are carrying out their own experiments in, involving blood and everything else. And, yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's fantastic, fantastic work. Um, but to answer the question, I think Brendan was coerced into a confession and unfortunately, that had a domino effect on Stephen um, because there's no DNA evidence, there's no eyewitnesses, there's no credible evidence that says he committed that murder. Right. It's based right. on this false confession of a boy who has various mental disabilities and he was taken advantage of. What yeah. really pains me about the show, watching... Um, watching the show is that he has no defense representation or appropriate adult in that room. He's a 14 right. year old boy that wants to go back to class or make sure his mum tapes the wrestling. Yeah, exactly. It, and he thinks he it is. Home. It's and then when like like you said, we dig into it. So we've read beyond. I mean, yeah. making a murder was just a window for us, and now we just completely opened up all the doors. And looking into it, when you read. Um, like the interrogations from um, Brendan, um, which we we were just started getting into on another on Brendan's channel, um, and it is it's heartbreaking to see the method that that they used. You can tell a method right away, and Brendan's uh, disability is language. He has a hard yeah. time with too many words, so right away they bombard him with a paragraph of words. And he's not saying that, not saying that, and he's trying to minimalize any uh, involvement by saying toes, and they add a foot. You see, then he says he sees part of a forehead, so they add a head. And at the end, you have him confessing to things that he just had no idea of, and it, it is you can see it. And that, to me, is what bothers me: is that we are all. Most of us are non-professionals. We're not lawyers. We're not um, specialists in con in confessions, and we can see it. So for us, it's mainly why don't they get it? What yeah. is in the law that stops it? Well, to me, it's the the being innocent means nothing in our justice system. It, it, whether you're, in, it doesn't mean anything once you're convicted. So they go by the conviction. So it's hard for them to get past the conviction, especially with a jury trial. Um, in your country, you don't have jury trials, correct? No, we do have jury trials. You yeah. do? They're, okay. Yeah, in, a, in about 4% of all cases, um, we'll, we'll end up in a jury trial. They're very rare in the larger scheme of things. Um, mm -hmm. The vast majority of cases are heard by a magistrate or a bench of magistrates who are lay people who are trained um, for mm -hmm. about 20 hours a, a year or so. Um, oh, see, but, they get yeah. training. They, they <laughs> juries get, get training. training. Yeah. No, That's not juries. The, 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 the magistrates. Juries. Oh, the magistrate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Com com complete lay people juries. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's I I I think we need education in our juries. They need to know what exactly their job is, and if they are being um, tried to be swayed from their view, um, they need to be able to report that. What can they ask? for to see, you know, I mean, there's so much as I, I'm just a regular person. If I got called for jury duty, 
I'm not really sure what my rights are there. So I really kind of think we need to change that. That's one of my things, but yeah, you know, so, but it, but in all your interviews um, that you've done with the lawyers, is there anything that you, just in general, what do you get out of from them? What they're saying, you know, I mean, what's your biggest um, takeaway? Um, the, the one I've not published this one yet. I, I'm still working on sort of editing it in uh, and sorting it out. But last week I spoke to Professor Geesley Johnson, who's the world lead on false confessions. Wow! And uh, so he's an a, a, like an, a, an expert witness in a number of cases and talks about how police manipulate um, suspects into confessing. So in terms of Brendan's case, we had a very brief conversation. Where he says like the officers make physical contact so he touches mm-hmm. brendan's leg or his thigh and just to make it seem like your friends and it's all very clever um and i think he is possibly the most interesting person not only that i've spoken to for the show but one of the most interesting people i've ever spoken to wow um, i'm looking just, forward to it <laughs> um, just the sheer breadth of cases he's dealt with both in england um in home in iceland in in the usa um, just th- this isn't a problem that's exclusive to one jurisdiction. Right. Every every jurisdiction has people that falsely confess. And then, yeah. I, then it sort of made me think of like, well, because there's different types of false confessions. You could do it for a raft of reasons, a lesser sentence, just to escape a particular uh, situation of like the police interrogation room. Um, so you just say you've done it. It just made me think about how many people in prison um, have falsely confessed and yeah. i would i would bet that there, there is a higher percentage than the majority of people w- would be willing to go um th- 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 there's a high percentage in prison of people yeah and then confessed. then you have these people like a uh, fallon saying that um innocent people don't confess that is not well, true it's absolutely not true there, there's a wealth of academic literature there's a wealth of cases of innocent people um, who don't confess. And when I teach false confessions to my students, I give them the story of me of when I was seven years old. I didn't realize it was a false confession at the time, but there were three boys in my primary school. So I, I was seven, seven or eight years old. And the teacher said, each of, each of you have had access to this book and you've taken it home. And there's lots of drawing and scribbling out in this book. Um, and you're not going out on break to go and play with your friends and go play football on, in the playground until one of you tells me who it is. Now, we are probably there for about three minutes. But I said, it, it happened in my house. I said my little sister did it. Um, she, 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 she was about four at the time. I said, she must have got it. Off. I remember this vividly. I said, she, she must have got it off of a record player in, in my parents' lounge, and she must have coloured it in. Now, I knew as I was saying that, that that is a complete lie. But I wanted to go and eat my chocolate bar and run around with my friends to get out of that situation. And yeah. I think, you know, it, it's the it's same. It's just as simple premise. as that, right. It really is. So, it's just um, as simple yeah. as that. I agree. I agree. I seen a case last night that I, I was watching on Reasonable Doubt. I don't remember the name of the case, but the guy only said one word just so he could get out of there. He just said one sentence. Um, I didn't want it to look like it was a suicide. It was something like that. And so yeah. they convicted him on that. So when it when you're convicted on words, that's the hardest thing in the world to prove that wasn't right, unless you see the cops beating them or whatever. But with with Brendan, they see you see him break him down, use his yeah. disability against him, and then um, you know convict him so it's like the poor kids on words that were fed to him because who shot him in the head that you know i mean if you look at any of his um in transcripts reading i mean not just watching but if you read word for word you will see how they put this stuff into his head how everything that they said was put there so he wasn't even going by anything that he seen at all you know he was just completely being Um, whatever you want me to say, I think I'm saying the right thing, you know? So I do have another question. um, Just one one more thing Uh, on, on the brain. He's doubly disadvantaged as well, because his Mm -hmm. defense representation effectively worked for the prosecution. 
it, that it was, was the question. <laughs> uh, was it, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was, it was, I, what do you see in the issues of Brendan's lawyer, Len Kinchinsky? Um, a, a disgrace to be called a defense lawyer. Uh, the, the way, you know, again, basing it on what you've seen, but the setting up with the polygraph testing, um, it, it, it was just, it's not zealously defending your client. It's not offering a, a defense or protecting his due process rights. It is not protecting protecting him. The defense lawyer is a shield from the yeah. state who have a vast array of resources and who are looking to convict you. You effectively have one friend, your defense lawyer. It is their job to go, to, to use an English sort of sporting analogy of cricket, to go into bat for you, to go and protect mm -hmm. you. And Brendan wasn't protected. And I right. find the idea of defense lawyers not being zealous advocates for their clients um, right. But difficult to some, especially when he was, you know, he had so many disadvantages. He, he, not only is he young, he has no representation in that initial interrogation. He has the, the, the mental disabilities as well. Um, right. I find that really, really, really difficult to yeah. understand. It, it, and and to know that i mean like i said we read everything so knowing that at the time when he was supposed to be representing him he hadn't even spoke to brendan before he was speaking to the press yeah. so that's like first of all you're 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 putting it out there in the press that he's a guilty person before you even spoke to it or even mm -hmm. looked at anything um so i really feel just like you and and everybody probably that's in the audience Brendan had nothing supporting him whatsoever. There was no support whatsoever at all. And that's a very sad thing. And they, in the courts, they won't look at that. They only look at paper, what's written, what went in in trial. And they don't look at, you know, the psyche of it or, you know, any of that. So I find that very difficult myself yeah. I, to, to, you know, and I don't know. I just find that very difficult, but um, okay. And here's a question for you. Okay. If you could change one thing in the justice system, what do you think you would change? Oh, yeah, that, that's a tough one. Um, I ask most of my guests this question. Uh, there, <laughs> there, there, there are many. Um, but I think if we could change it from sort of end and then going back to start to have benefits, what I would do, I would send less people to prison. Um, I would adopt like the Nordic model that they use in Scandinavia of, you know, you need a higher, you need to be sentenced for a, a greater amount of time. You know, people in England and Wales can be sent to prison for, you know, five, six weeks, you know, a smaller amount of time than that. And I find the idea that prison doesn't work uh, in this country, around about almost 50% of everyone who's released from prison will be back inside prison within two years. So whatever you're doing there to deter them from crime, simply doesn't work so i i would look to sort of a more rehabilitative model of not incarcerating people because you have so many negative connotations to serve in a prison sentence and i think if reoffending rates are the same for serving a sentence in the community as they are in prison and generally they are broadly mm -hmm. similar stop sending people to prison, stop destroying families, destroying careers. Um, that, that would be my change. Um, right, not rehabilitation. For, yeah, not for serious offences. If you're going to go to prison right. for two years, prison's probably the right place if you are a dangerous threat. But we have 77,000 people in prison in England and Wales, and a, a large number of them will be serving sentences of six months or, or, or less. And mm -hmm. um, I don't think prison's the right place. Yeah, and well, here in uh, in the United States, when you're a prisoner, when you get out, you still are uh, in a prison situation. You're on parole, which you know limits you from jobs and housing and everything else. And and in your country, I, if I'm not mistaken, once you've done your time, you've done your time. You don't have no parole uh, or we, probation. We we do. We so once you, if you're given a prison sentence, you generally serve half of it inside the prison estates, and then you serve half on what would be called license, which would have conditions about how you behave. You have to check in with the probation service and, and, and things like that. So we we do manage offenders in that way, but I, I I just think that prison destroys families, and I think it would be better off 
not being overused, but it's it's a populist tool. You know, every political manifesto around general election time, you know, we're going to crack down on crime. We're going to make you safer. Well, you're not because you yeah. don't. But, yeah. you, know, you know, you can't convince the, the right wing tabloids in this country to move away from this idea of retribution and punishment has to hurt. It doesn't. Punishment has to work. And yes. pu pu punishment has a broad spectrum of, of meanings and reform and rehabilitation is a perfectly valid one. Oh. I hope that's not me. Oh, Hello? sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry. That that's Linda Low Budget Productions for you. It happens <laughs> once in a while, so I, I apologize. <laughs> but yeah, I agree with you. Um, re rehabilitation is is a, a big major step that nobody really puts any funds into or no. any. They don't push it. You know, they just push putting them behind bars. And we have this paid prison situation here in the United States, which is uh, once you have that, you have open doors for corruption, you know, yeah. because you're, you, you just want more people in there, you know, and oh, you yeah. don't really, they're herded like cows and, you know, they're just, nobody, nobody cares. And there's mental issues, you know, nowadays that they didn't deal with before um, that makes a higher crime rate and higher people going in. So it, it really is re rehabilitation. I've, I've said that myself. I do believe that if they had, uh, you know, drug offenders, uh, put them in a drug jail, you know, get them on rehab while they're in there and get them off of it and show them a different way before you release them. Because otherwise they're just going to go right back to what they had, or, you know, and this holding it over their head for so long, like, because we really have stiff parole around here. That really makes it hard to go on and say, okay, I paid my price, but you're still paying your price. You yeah. don't get housing or jobs, you know. And I, 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 I find it very interesting in terms of um, child sexual offenders and public disclosure of those offences um, in mm -hmm. the United States. And we study it a bit in one of the modules that, that I teach at university. And it's like, well, how do, does someone move on? Granted, it's a, it's a horrific crime. You've been punished. But surely for society to function, everybody needs to you know, acclimatized back into society right. with such an, an open register of sexual offending history, how can they? Yeah. Um, I, I've looked at some websites, um, you know, you can punch in zip codes and it will bring up an area and there's little sort of pins sort of fly up of all the registered sex offenders in that area. And I get the public protection argument, but from this sort of shaming and, you know, some of these offences are 40 years old. With, yeah. with nothing yeah. nothing else on the record except for that 40 years ago. And that's not to underplay how horrific that crime was. But if you want people to exist, we have to move away from shaming and sort of othering groups right. of people. It doesn't matter who they are. Um, Putting a label on them and leaving it there without exactly. giving them a chance to rehabilitate or have a chance in, in society. is You might as well just stick them in a hole somewhere and expect them to survive they're just it's just not going to happen you know, and if, you keep, 100%. If, you, if you keep telling someone that this is what they are if you use the labeling theory i'm going to tell you what you are i'm going to treat you like you're a piece of dirt what are yep. they going to do they're going to go underground fall into old habits and the yep. problem never goes away yeah that's right that's why i think like i said you know rehabilitate this person for this rehabilitate this person for that you got to have some kind i mean that's what prison and jails are supposed to be about is rehabilitation and yeah. just like with the death penalty to deter i don't agree with that it's yeah. not a deterring for doing crimes if yeah. you are that kind of mindset and you kill people knowing you're going to die is maybe something you want um yeah. maybe it doesn't scare you who cares you're you're getting away with things that are you know terrible and you don't have that mindset. So you don't think of that. So to me, the death penalty for one can kill innocent people because of the number of wrongful convictions that we have all Absolutely. around the world. You know, yeah. so I've, I've been against that. And that's the same mindset they have. Let's just put them in there and they're okay. You know, things are going to be okay. They'll come out. They'll learn. Actually, they learn worse crimes. They are in a place where there's there's a mixture of all kinds of people in a prison so it doesn't really give them a chance to do anything but 
but survive. And with yeah. just fight or flight, and that's it. Yeah. You know, so I agree. There was another question I'm going to go up here. Let me see. I think it had to do with what is your thoughts on Fallon, Gone, and Kratz? Um, <laughs> well, Kratz would be the, the one I know um, most about. And um, mm -hmm. one, one of the things I asked all the people who were connected with the case that I've spoken to was I was shocked by the daily press conferences and I think when I spoke to Jerry or Dean or perhaps both of them, I likened it to like an NFL coach, you know, going to a press conference after a game and digesting things for the media. And I, I, I was shocked that A, that happened and B, you know, they were allowed to do that because one of the biggest problems with jurors is the fact that they are swayed. No matter what the judge says, don't listen to outside considerations. I'm sorry, you can't ask an ordinary person to ignore things that they hear. Everybody right. is influenced by something. And if you have this sort of daily rundown of, you know, this in a nutshell of a really complex issue, I can't see how it can't prejudice how people think. And right. it's, it's just wrong. And it's morally. <laughs> uh, absolutely, morally and ethically. And you, you can't unring the bell. You just cannot no. unring that bell. And his conference was the most shocking thing. That press conference was the most shocking thing I've ever seen. And um, um, another one of our um, YouTube um, community persons who's passed away, Eric Cozy, interviewed a FBI agent. And he said if he would have brought that, if he would have did that without collaborating the words with the evidence, there's just no way you could do that. And here's Kratz just spout, spouting this, you know, narrative out there without even checking anything. It it did poison the the community. It poisoned the jury pool. And you're right; nobody can unhear that. Um, yeah. It still resonates, you know. It really does. So yeah. If, and I, oh, here's, I, I I think as well in in, in terms of the the, the Kratz um, sort of daily rundowns and the press conference once you know they had the confession from Brendan. I think. Um, it basically showed that their case was weak. So we have mm -hmm. to influence public opinion. We don't have much here. So we're mm -hmm. going to go go out and do something that's really controversial to get our narrative into the mainstream rather than just who's listening in the courtroom. Um, I, I think it really exposed a weak case. Yeah, it did. And it's shocking to me how they ever got convicted. I mean... It's a lot of these cases are really shocking to me. Yeah. Um, the legal, but it's legal word too. It's the way uh, the the courts, like the, the um, circuit courts and things, the way they read law. You know, I mean, I just watched a um, a, a case where um, Kathleen was in front of the Ninth Circuit and she was talking about fabricated evidence, and the one guy was saying that it's okay if he if if he's guilty, it's okay to put fabricated <laughs> evidence and. In my view, that's utterly ridiculous. You should never allow any fabricated evidence, you know? I mean, so it, it's the way they read the law and the way the law is written. And from speaking to Jerry and Dean, uh, Laura and Kathleen as well, that, that's my biggest takeaway of the American justice system. The police are permitted to deliberately mislead suspects, to tell mm. them something in order to elicit this confession on the basis that if you didn't do it, you won't confess. Whereas in in England and Wales, the police are not allowed to mislead uh, suspects in order to elicit a confession. But yeah, um, yeah it's, it's a shocker because it, if you're under the influence of alcohol, you can't remember and you think, well, the police are saying this, I must have done it. Yeah, There's going to be a sentence discount for a guilty plea, let's censor it. And yeah. Yeah. If you don't understand your Miranda rights, you don't yeah. know what you're giving up. And a lot of people, really lay people, don't understand. They just think, okay, this is authority. And in in my view, I see Brendan as that's an elder. Um, that's uh, somebody yeah. I'm supposed to respect and not yeah. go against. You know. So there's that too. It's it's all in. It's a lot to do with somebody's psyche. What you're doing. So it, it's, it's kind of, very complicated. I think it's ingrained in us is children. You know, I tell my children, I've got, they're both under 10. And it's, you know, if you're lost, find a policeman. A policeman will help you. You know, yeah. it's not until you're much older that you realize that there is corruption. 
there is deceit and mm -hmm. the police need certain results to justify certain actions and right. I, I think that's what they did in terms of this they needed that confession to convict two people and I don't necessarily think that they believed that Brendan would necessarily get convicted on the basis of the confession evidence alone but here we are yeah. he did yeah. And, yeah yeah here we are 15 years later exactly yeah. Um, Yoris has a question. It says, what is Brendan's legal framework once if so? Brent, Stephen Avery would be exonerated. Would he be let free or not? I, I don't, I, I must confess, I don't know the intricacies of the appeal law in, in U.S. cases, but I think if the Stephen Avery domino falls, I think almost certainly just by virtue of that, because if Stephen was the guy that, committed yeah. this offense the, the the brendan case will also fall fall to pieces as well um, yeah and that's what i asked kathleen last week and you know that's basically what she said that almost yeah. certainly one one will fall with the other and right. I, I think if Steve, if stephen goes first brendan's will will um will follow suit yeah yeah i'm i'm hoping that will be it but i do know of another case where there was just words, you know, and Ryan Ferguson oh, yeah. and that he's still sitting there. So I guess it's, you know, hit or miss. I just pray that because Stephen's case would be knocked down so badly by Kathleen, which I'm so yeah. looking forward to, you know, yeah. that it would just fall apart. There's absolutely no way you could, you know, convince him, even though there's two killers with two different types of death and one victim, it, you know, I mean, that in itself is bizarre. Okay. Mm. And Stephen being convicted twice, wrongfully is another bizarre thing i mean it's yeah. like i think this is a history making justice system case i really think that this will will make some changes immunity is something i really hope they get rid of you know i mean them being able to lie and then just get away with it, it yeah. when they, they knowingly know it's wrong i mean that you might as well just give them the key to the city and say hey have at it do whatever you want you know yeah. i mean that's just basically what it is so yeah that bothers me a lot so what are your future plans for your channel and and where you would like to go with this i mean you have a lot of publications and a lot of things that you've written and your thesis on um what is it the the day of a defense something a defense the lawyer modern era yeah, so the defense law in the modern era is my PhD thesis, and it looked at the idea that we no longer have classic adversarial lawyers who are that sort of zealous advocate, as I described earlier. We now have cogs in a process, and the process is all geared around efficiency, doing things quickly, and doing things as cheaply as possible. Um, so that's pretty much the starting point for all of my research. I use that as the foundation and try to examine sort of changes in the justice system that are just driven by efficiency. In England and Wales, we've had a lot over the last um, 20 years to make the process more managerial or bureaucratic in nature. And I'm actually writing a paper with an academic paper with, with Jerry Buting. Um, oh, great. A, a, like a comparison between my experiences in England and Wales, and he's going to cover the US side, and we're going to cover the two because arguably this managerialist stuff stems mm -hmm. from the US. We've taken our influence there. So hopefully we'll have that out in, in the summer. Um, great. I look forward to great. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you have any uh, real um, lined up? I'm really going to look forward to your, when you release it, when are you releasing this, um, your um, next video with the, um, Ho hopefully your within the next, Hopefully within the next ten, seven to ten days. Um, I'm Great. swamped with with marking coursework at the moment for my students, so that takes priority sort of over the channel. Um, but that should hopefully be out in the next seven to ten days. And then what I'd like as well is I've got a couple of people lined up who have um, just private citizens that have had you know, experiences within the criminal justice system. So I'm going to talk to a young lady who was um, a victim of domestic violence and coercive control in terms mm -hmm. of her partner. And her partner was one of the first people to be convicted in Wales for coercive control in terms of forcing her to do certain things under his kind of threatening demeanour. Um, oh, wow. So I'm going to speak to her about... Um, about her experiences and you know how that felt, you know, sort of coming forward and making this stand because 
as with a lot of domestic violence, it's kind of brushed under the carpet. The, the, right. the victim might think, well, I don't want to complain. I don't want to do this. Um, oh, so, yeah. I hope it's not going down. Anymore. Yep. Sorry. That's okay. It's fine. <laughs> sorry, I'm um, sorry. I didn't even hear the last part. I'm sure it's the last <laughs> sentence that I didn't hear, but they might have. I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, but, but basically, yeah, just get some more sort of, you know, h human sort of participants in terms of, you know, what their experiences are in, in the criminal justice, not necessarily lawyers or advocates right. or, or whatever. It, but, but, it's but, good to hear from regular people, you know, I mean, it's great. Sounds like you got a great lineup. I know you're you're interested in helping students with uh, the following criminal justice procedures and defense rights and yeah. um, uh access to justice um i'm just reading from your um your i mean long list of things i mean i'd be interested in reading some have you wrote a book <laughs> are you um, probably yeah. will write a book after this yeah um i i've written a couple of books um one of my uh passions is uh, disclosure law uh which looks at sort of evidence that should be given to the defense in order to you know balance out the inequality of arms between the prosecution and defense you still there and i i've written a book on, on the phd that's being published in um washington dc um hopefully in september Okay, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll wait then. No worries. Uh, what do I do to relax? I watch a lot of sport. Um, so yeah, sport. I try to read sort of just general, easy reading books, listen to music, play with the kids, that sort of stuff. What did I think of Wales on Saturday? Is that to do with the rugby, Jay? I, I, what, rugby's I am so one's cool. sorry. That's quite all right. I'm so sorry. I apologize. Linda Low Budget really kicks in about this time. So. That's, that's quite all right. <laughs> And my fellow people out there are going, Linda, you need to hardwire. You need to hardwire. So I apologize. I'm so sorry. No problem. So okay, I'm 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 like stuttering here because I'm not sure where we left off. But we, I think we were talking about the future of your channel. So and what your future plans were. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Hopefully, to just keep growing it, grow the subscribers, uh, grow the views. I mean, the Kathleen video. I I don't think in my wildest dreams that I think within a week it would be at sort of six, uh, five and a half thousand. Um, most yeah. of them in, in and around the high hundreds, but, um, Oh, you're yeah. going to get a lot of people from now on, believe me. Good. So that, that, we are, great. we are very much uh, welcoming you to our community. We love what Thank you're doing. You. Um, it's fantastic. I mean, I'm telling you, it's just like, who is this person that was able to get all these people? But I, I would imagine your background has a lot to do with it and what you're doing. So it, it is good. You know, I mean, you can't go to every little YouTuber and be a be on there. I understand that. And your interviews are very 
um, thorough and they're, they're what we want to know. So you're, you're asking the right questions and we as a whole appreciate that very much. I'll let you know that. <laughs> so, yeah. and yeah. I'll be plugging your channel and giving the links and all this and that, and definitely be looking forward to your interview with the specialist on confessions, because that is yes, one of the yes. good things. Yes, I mean, yeah. it is such really a big thing. I'm not even sure if I'm con connected with the chat yet. So if there's any questions anybody has or anything. Um, if someone I, asks me, um, would I be interested in interviewing Ken Kratz and what would I ask him? Um, oh, I, yeah. I, 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 I sent him a Twitter message. I couldn't find his email address. And I, I sent him a Twitter message when, when I started the channel um, to see whether he'd be interested in coming on. And he, he didn't. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, not don't let me go out again. He, 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 did, he didn't respond. But I would be interested he didn't answer. in. No, he didn't answer. I would be interested in asking him um, just what was the driving force behind those daily press conferences? Was it to control the narrative or was there something else, um, some other reason? Yeah. Because, um, yeah, I, I think that's the other thought. Of I think that's a, a lot of our um, questions, too. Why would you want to be in front of the press pushing and pushing this narrative that you have if it isn't? I mean, usually, um, they avoid all these kind of questions and, and avoid going into the press because they don't want to hurt their case. Yeah. To me, it seemed like he just wanted everybody to believe this narrative he had. So he had to keep pushing it. Um, uh, and I think that's all we As a comparison to, to in England and Wales, we had um, a young lady in her twenties, a couple of weeks ago was, was discovered is being murdered. And, um, or having been murdered, and it was the the suspect currently in sort of police detention was a metropolitan police officer, and some news agencies report his name and say who they are, uh, say who he was. Some news agencies just say, you know, the suspect is a serving metropolitan police officer because of that prejudice. That if anything can prejudice the prosecution's case at trial. Because despite my interests in defence rights, I still want justice to be done. That's the most right. in, the, the, the the most important takeaway. Justice has to be done, but there's two sides to that. It's not just prosecution minded stuff. There are right. important defence rights as well. Exactly, and I think it gets lost. It really does. I mean, uh, it it's a fine line. What you do, you want you want it, it's, it boils down to truth and. Yeah. And how how you fairly get it, you know what yeah. I'm saying? You fairly get it, not coercion, not this lying. The police being able to lie that just sets up corruption. It sets for for a no win situation, as far as I'm concerned. For anybody, if you're guilty, I want to see you go. But if you're not guilty and you've been lied to and coerced and things like within the Avery case, um, yeah. that's just not justice. Yeah. You know, um, a lot of people are on the fence about Stephen, but um, when you read into it, I, I personally don't think either one of them are guilty um, in any way. But no. even that, even if you if you do think Stephen's guilty, the the trial in itself and the way the evidence was gotten and the you know the conflict of interest and the way the prosecution was repeatedly saying something that's not fair. It's no. not fair. He had not a fair jury, jury pool. So you're right. I think they should be banned from saying anything, honestly, until yeah. the case is done. Then give your outcome on the case, maybe, you know. Yeah. But I think a lot of them just get this, um, you know, especially during, um, you know, when political things are running or it's an election year, they're, they're pushing things that, like you said, you don't give. So it's just words. A lot of it is just words. Yeah, and it, you know, so I don't know. What does Doctor Johnson think about the press? Oh, there was a um, uh, a video released by um, Ken Kratz, and it was um, Jerry Buting and Stephen in a privacy lawyer privacy room, and um, they were filmed. They were filmed from the jail. So he wants to know what you think about filming in a privacy room. Um, I, I've not seen the video or, he or heard about that, but if that's the case, I mean, lawyer cl client um, communications are privileged. People can't know 
what was said, you can say stuff to your lawyer and he's not allowed to repeat that. It's privacy yeah. because, and that's sacrosanct. He yeah. is your shield. Um, so yeah. who, who, who was, who was recording? The police were recording all. It was, um, I would imagine it was the jail uh, recording it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. No, that, 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 that's woeful. And, and, and any evidence, if, so if that happened in, in England and Wales, any evidence um, that came out of that um, privacy recording would be ruled inadmissible at trial, so the jury would never get to hear it. There would be no net benefit. So that's the basic idea. Any yep. kind of like ill-gotten evidence or you know misleading people you can't have any net benefit of that. So that right. would be struck out here in England. Right. Do you think the law information should be put? Do you think law information should be punished that involves? Oh, do you think the law should be punished in the Avery case? I think that's what Paul's trying to say. The law enforcement officers. I mean, it, it's, it's difficult. Um, because I, I suppose you, you really have to scratch beneath the surface and find out their intention that influenced their behaviour. If, you know, if Kratz didn't think he didn't do it, but there's enough evidence here and we can control this narrative and that will influence people and we'll get the conviction. Um, yeah, if there's been things that, like the recording of the privacy group, yeah, absolutely. If officers were found to have planted evidence, yes, absolutely. Answer to the full force of the law. Um, right. I, I don't think officers should be immune from poor behaviour or abhorrent behaviour that simply means an innocent person's in jail because you are corrupt. That needs to be rooted out. And the only way you're going to root that out of a police force or any institution is to set examples. Right. And, and, and that uh, immunity, that's what brings on this. That brings on them being able to uh, fabricate or plant or whatever, you know. So, yeah, yeah I agree. I agree. Wants to, um, Jay would like to know, what was your opinion after watching Making a Murderer 1 or 2? So I watched season one and um, I didn't know anything about the case at all. So everything I knew, I, I didn't look it up whilst watching it. I wanted it to be, uh, you know, a surprise. And I was right. shocked that, that, um, of ha how it ended. But I did feel very, and I think Jerry and Dean were very good lawyers. I mm -hmm. know they've come into to criticism. I, they, they're sound men. And I yeah, think they did I the best. That the, the best of what they could they have you know an, in, an enviable situation of just the sheer weight of all of this they mm -hmm. could have done stuff better as Kathleen pointed out in, in my chat with her but after watching season two I I felt like with Kathleen with, with, with Stephen and Steve and Laura with, with Brendan I'm confident that these dominoes are going to fall this corruption mm -hmm is going to be exposed and i think both men w will be free and i think kathleen has a slightly easier start point and i think she points mm -hmm. this out in the chat she knows what didn't work so she knows not what to waste her time with she has right. a baseline of things that they can follow up and right. I, I i think ultimately she will be extremely successful i mean right. if you if you were looking for the epitome of that zealous advocate that's kathleen zellner um, yeah, I agree. Um, so, She's a tiger. Yeah. She's, She's a tiger. Yeah. And yeah. and I agree with you as far as um, Jerry and um, Dean are concerned. They Once you read what they had to deal with, like if you read word for word in the transcripts and the trial and all this, they were stopped, stopped, stopped on so many things. I mean, so yeah. it, they did the best they could. They really do. And you're right. Um, Kathleen knows what didn't work the first time. She's going at it like a tiger and she just isn't going to give up. I think she's continually, like she said, higher. she'll just write another motion. She'll yep. just keep on writing them motions. So, yeah, so that's great. But I, 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 I don't know. I don't know what to say to you. Who's, and I hope I'm not, yep, I hope I was losing you again. Oh, um, there we go, yeah. 
<laughs> it's Linda low budget. Sorry. Everybody <laughs> knows except for my guests. I'm sorry. That's quite all right. Don't worry. <laughs> you know, we're just not, you know, we do the best we can here. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think I covered all my questions and it, you're just a fascinating person. I look forward to seeing a lot more of what you're going to do and um, reading um, your writings with Buting. I'm looking forward to that. And yeah. now everybody gets to know who was that guy. I mean, because they yeah. were all, who is this guy? We got to know who this guy is. So, yeah, Zellner's on the, is, in, yes, she is. So if there's not any other questions, I think I will let him go. He's a busy man. He has a family. And this is 830 at your time. Yeah. So It is, um, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's good. I think we're fine. If I get any questions, I'll email you on them. <laughs> Thank you for um, being my guest. Thank you. If I can ask if you've not subscribed to the channel, if you could check it out, like it, subscribe it. And um, I, I think someone's posted the Twitter handle. It's at C Natters on Twitter. But thank yep. you for having it's me. It's all in the description, too. Great. Everything you need to know is down there. All your your links to your YouTube and your Twitter. Wonderful. And now um, we'll just be seeing more of what you get to bring us. I, I'm very, very appreciative of it. Everybody here loved your interview, thinks it's wonderful. And thank all you. of them have been good. So thank you very much for being my guest. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And please check thank out you. his channel. Yeah, he's got a lot more good things coming. All Cheers. right. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Thank you.